So uh, thank you, Judy and CGS, for this convening. It's good to look out in the room and see some familiar faces as well as some new ones. And uh, since I'm a fisherman, I'm going to go a little bit further downstream and look at um, the experience of, of high school teachers and middle school teachers uh, and look at some of the opportunities, but also some of the challenges. And I think I'll start with the challenges. I think fundamentally, teachers can't teach what they don't know. So after years of working with Facing History and working around the race and membership in American history, a uh, case study of the American eugenics movement, I'm struck year after year uh, by the number of teachers who come to the seminars and never even heard of the word eugenics. Right? So they can't teach what they don't know. Um, and in light of the fact that the information is new for many teachers, I think it's also fair to suggest that they are confronted with this and that brings a sense of embarrassment and shame to them, quite frankly. And so as teachers, we also have to think about the teachers, their own role in terms of what they teach and why they don't teach it, right? So we have to work with teachers to pull them into the mix. But beyond that, I think that history has political implications that can be either positive or negative. And while I would argue that all societies have a need to create a compelling narrative, one that moves citizens to participate, when we denude our history of the sorrowful episodes of the past, it may leave us conceptually stranded. And I think in many cases, that's where we find ourselves with the history of eugenics. Um, this constructed amnesia uh, leaves people, I think, in many cases, conceptually stranded. When I do speak with teachers, and they do say that they are familiar with the history of eugenics, more often than not, they will associate it with Nazi Germany. And while that's not a bad thing, and I think it's fair to suggest that Facing History's original work emerges out of an, an exploration of the fall of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Nazism in Germany, and the history of eugenics is very central to that, um, I think this overconnecting to the, uh, to the uh, history of the Nazis is problematic conceptually. One is, I think, that in following much of the earlier research, it makes people believe that if the state is the primary operative sort of agent, that once the state has been addressed, then the ideas don't have any more traction. And I would argue that when you're dealing with the history of eugenics, you're dealing with the history of an ideology rather than a discrete historical moment in time or a political movement. I would also say that because of the space that Nazis hold within our conceptual sort of space, we're not like them. The Nazis are the embodiment of everything evil. So when you put that out as the, as the marker, then to engage people about our own government's practice and these ideas can create a level of dissonance that sometimes promotes a shutdown. Um, and it also just denies the fact that these ideas have utility and have lives beyond the institutions themselves. I think that also leads to students not being able to see the relationship between uh, the ideological underpinning of those events in the past and how that same ideology maybe worked today. I like to say that ideology does the heavy lifting. You don't have to be a true believer, but if you've invested in or you've imbibed enough in the ideology, it's difficult to uh, to not push back against it, particularly if you don't have the history that allows you to ask the sort of critical questions that you may need to add, may need to ask. Um, sort of moving on, some of the institutional challenges, I think, are that there's little to no mandate um, to present this history uh, within history standards. Uh, so that's a challenge. Uh, and I think it's a particularly challenge in a time of increased over-reliance on standardized testing which not only narrows the scope of what gets covered, but it fundamentally shapes what teachers do in the classroom and how it marshals, it shapes how they marshal their energies and, and, and frank, quite frankly, their pedagogical practices. It also is disengaging to students. Um, let's see, limited resources uh, also lead to truncated or diminished opportunities for professional development uh, for teachers. I mean, fortunately, we operate as a nonprofit, so many teachers can come and participate without having to come out of pocket, which I think is a great uh, way to, to be in the mix with them. I would also say that our current political space makes attending these issues seem like less of a priority for some, although for others it seems like it's a higher priority. Um, one other thing I'll sort of get to and then I'll sort of move to opportunities really quickly. Another thing is that we have maladaptive strategies for navigating race in a society. Um, colorblind teaching practice is actually pervasive in many classrooms. While it's not universal, uh, we see it and encounter it with some, with some frequency. Which means that this practice intentionally avoids teaching around issues of race, which then fundamentally affects what curriculum or content is presented to students. Uh, part of this is predicated on the idea that if you talk about race, uh, then you must be a racism, because racism has become 
sort of identified with people with bad ideas and bad attitudes. And so if you're not a person with bad attitudes or bad ideas, you're not a racist. And so what that means is you create this dance in the classroom in which you do everything you can to, to skirt the issues of race, which then leaves students uh, without the opportunities to develop the skill sets to be in the conversation. Uh, one look at our political discourse or lack thereof suggests that we don't do that necessarily all that well. And it may also leave them conceptually stranded. I think um, very quickly, I think in terms of connection to the, new, to the new technologies, the absence of that historical connection doesn't allow people to understand the relationship between the, the meaning that's ascribed to issues of class, gender, sexuality, or race, because they look at these things fragmented in a fragmented way. When we deal with the isms in t traditionally in diversity work, we look at them as separate silos, not uh, manifestations of an ideological hub. Uh, increasing opportunities are the emergence of biotech uh, classrooms in which these discussions uh, provoke and invite engagement with these issues. Uh, increasingly, in the past years, I've seen a lot of science teachers come and attend the seminars because they've spoken with their colleagues who are operating out of history frames or English language arts frames and see the reason, see that there's a real uh, uh, academic argument in terms of intellectual rigor and student, enga and student engagement for why they should be in the conversation together. And so increasingly, I think these opportunities exist for us, and that if we're strategic about how we approach them, we can get a place at the table. And I think the last thing that I would say, two things, just really quickly. One is that um, emerging scholarship is providing new insights and new opportunities to engage uh, with these ideas, as well as inviting young people to the table. Young people who engage with these ideas may continue down the road to become scholars themselves. Uh, work like the recent events in North Carolina also provide us with opportunities that we shouldn't allow to pass as a moment in time, but rather than simply um, make apologies, we should look for ways to sustain the engagement uh, and look for structural uh, engagement, such as um, curricular requirements, uh, monuments and memorials. We could use the tools of transitional justice to create a sustained dialogue on these issues rather than relegate the history of eugenics uh, to the ash heap of the past. And so I'm way over time, so I'm going to stop there. And, uh, Thank you. That's great.